Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Tonight, the Democrats and the Republicans for president. What have we learned from their first debates? We're in the house of Ronald Reagan. You know, Ronald Reagan said Ronald Reagan was a president of strength. Ronald Reagan used to say those are the things that Ronald Reagan taught us. Big ideas like Ronald Reagan. The Ronald Reagan. 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 President Reagan. Republicans and Democrats coming up, but first, here are this week's online video picks. Video pick number one, as Congress and the President continue their standoff over whether to get out of Iraq, Oliver Stone is getting into the act. The politically oriented director shot this online ad for MoveOn.org. One day there was a riot in the Abu Ghraib market area. We had 2,000 people from the community protest our presence in their country. These were not terrorists. We were told that we were there to liberate these people. They were shooting at us to keep American soldiers in Iraq for an indefinite period of time being attacked by an unidentifiable enemy is wrong, immoral, and irresponsible. Support our troops. Bring them home. So that's one view of the American presence in Iraq, but here's something new on the web. Video pick number two. The Pentagon itself is posting videos about the troops' good work direct to YouTube, trying to go around the media filter and reach you directly. Here's part of one that may be a little bit morbid, but shows the nation-building effort in a whole different light. It's about training Iraqis in mortuary science. This training is going to consist of a five-day classroom and hands-on training. Uh, once they uh, finish this training and they go into the hands-on, that's where they pretty much pick up the, the majority of the actual work. The goal of the class is simple, train enough Iraqi soldiers to one day work receiving, processing and storing the bodies of Iraqi army soldiers from the battlefield to a collection site. The class the soldiers receive is an abbreviated version of the Mortuary Fair School focusing mainly on collection point management. An interpreter translates Sergeant Moore's instructions from English to Arabic. An Iraqi army officer that asks that his face not be shown explains why the class is important to Iraqis not just as soldiers but as Muslims. It's very important work here. The dead soldiers must be received by his family or relatives, so they take the necessary procedures of burying them. It's very important issue. As we're instructed in Islam, people should be honored by burying them as fast as possible. Currently, coalition forces are primarily responsible for processing the remains of Iraqi army soldiers. But that is about to change with the grand opening of the first Iraqi Mortuary Affairs collection point on the Iraqi side of Camp Taji. The purpose behind establishing this facility is to be sure the Army, Navy, Air Force, and National Police are taken care of and treated with respect. This facility is just the beginning for the Iraqi army and the Iraqi military of defense. So very different views of American troops in Iraq from MoveOn.org and the Pentagon itself. Our next two videos come from a file we'll call Self Love. Video pick number three from France, where conservative candidate Nicolas Sarkozy was elected president this week after running the more web-savvy campaign. After the election, he used his website, Sarkozy.fr, for an online victory lap. The word ensemble in French means together. Too bad almost half the country is angry and suspicious as he starts his term. We'll see how it goes, n'est-ce pas? 
Video pick number four, self-love from Brooklyn's newest luxury condo, the one that used to be the Board of Education headquarters. Now it has its own condo sales blog at 110livingstonstreet.net. Educators, brace yourselves. I was initially attracted to 110 Livingston because it's an old building and it has a lot of character to it, uh, but you still get a nice, clean, brand new apartment on the inside. It's an historic building and I feel that I was purchasing a part of history. I just didn't want anything sterile, just a building. You know, they're going up one after another. This had character, it had its vintage. I love this neighborhood. This neighborhood is fantastic. It's so diverse. You just have everyone from everywhere and great neighborhood feeling. It's a neighborhood. That's what I love about it. Everything's here. There's so much going on in the neighborhood. There's so much more that's going to be going on. You can just walk down the street and you can feel like you're home. Everyone's proud to be here, I feel like. And it's just a great place. I, I think Brooklyn's so hot right now that I think it's, it's actually great to live in Brooklyn. Within a few minutes, I'm in the city. I'm anywhere I want to be. It's a perfect location. There's nothing like it in New York City. Uh, you, you're in Manhattan, but you're not in Manhattan. You, you go home at night, basically. You don't feel like you're still in the middle of craziness. When someone asks where you're from, you say, I'm from Brooklyn. And there's something to that, a lot of character to that. Don't you want to live around those folks? I know I do. One slight correction on the web address, it's 110livingston.net. But remember when Mayor Giuliani said he wanted to blow up 110 Livingston Street? I guess $700 a square foot is one way to do it. And video pick number five from Gothamist.com, the New York City surveillance camera walking tour. Let's go. The tour is broken into three parts. A general introduction to aerospace surveillance and a spy helicopter was above us just a little while ago. Hopefully it'll return. Then we'll see the cameras on the ground, which there are 179 of them. We'll see about 20 or 30 of them, but they have been, as it were, cherry-picked for interest. And then there will be an advanced part of the tour that talks about the perfect surveillance device, which is a cell phone. Across the street, on top of the city-owned pole, you'll see two lights hanging down. They are translucent. And in the middle, hanging on, on an upside-down U-pole, is a tiny little bulb with a black dome on the bottom. That is a surveillance camera, disguised to look as a, like a light or an ornament. Okay, that's a spy, plane, that's a spy helicopter. If you see on the bottom of it, there are white-looking ray domes, white things that stand out to your eye. Hopefully that surveillance will come back and show themselves more clearly so we can see a little better what their, what their ray domes are like. Well, let's keep going since we have lots to see. This is the Nigerian consulate. The Nigerian consulate has given itself the right to install several hybrid between first and second generation cameras. First generation in that they are shoebox style. Second generation is that they are planted on top of motorized platforms that can be moved around and swiveled around. The final frontier emerges, which is cameras that get so small you can't see them, even if you have what we're doing, which is looking up and looking for cameras. One camera that would not be mapped, that I don't particularly have an objection to, is this one, because it's obeying what seems to be common sense. They can only see people who have already been inside and are exiting. They are not indiscriminately watching people on the sidewalk. That, it seems, that is an understandable camera, or I would say that's a security camera. Everything else that we're seeing are surveillance cameras. This is their property, and they can tell us to leave. This is our property, and they can't. And of course, the problem with putting surveillance cameras is the surveillance cameras don't stop seeing when you're standing here and only see you here, or only see you when you're here and not there. 
So this, this is this is this is anti-terrorism at work. That little ugly little thing that says Department of Envi uh, Environmental Protection. Yeah. That's actually working against terror, and it's not a visual device. It's smelling the air for explosives. So when you walk down the street in our fair city, don't forget to smile. And those are our online video picks for this week. Coming up in a minute, the Democrats and Republicans for president. What have we learned about them from their first debates? We'll see which clips are making the rounds online and take your calls. This is Brian Lehrer Live. Brandon. Hi, I'm Matthew Goldstein, the Chancellor of the City University of New York. Look who's teaching at CUNY, Michio Kaku, Stringfield theorist and international authority on theoretical physics. John Corleano, Academy Award and Pulitzer Prize winner in music. David Nassau, winner, Bancroft Prize for Best Biography. Jill Barganetti, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Gregory Rabassa, recipient, the National Medal of Arts in 2006 from President Bush. Elizabeth Nunez, winner, American Book Award. Godfrey Gums, American Physical Society Fellow and member, New York Academy of Sciences. World-class talent, award-winning scholars, CUNY is their classroom, CUNY is your university. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. You can also sign up for our free podcast at CUNY.tv. So let's talk presidential politics. The Democrats and Republicans have each had their first debate. We'll see some clips that are making the rounds online and some others. We'll take your calls and talk to one Democratic-leaning and one Republican-leading commentator. With us now are Joel Mowbray, syndicated columnist and author, and Joe Connison, New York Observer and Salon.com columnist and author of It Can Happen Here, Authoritarian Peril in the Age of Bush, his new book. Thanks a lot for coming in, both of you. you. And let's begin with the issue of abortion, which made news in the Republican debate primarily for Rudy Giuliani's answer, uh, Giuliani's answer, as you probably know, but which also had at least one other notable response. Starting with you, Governor, would the day that Roe v. Wade is repealed be a good day for America? Absolutely. Senator? Be a glorious day of human liberty and freedom. Governor? Yes, it was wrongly decided. Governor? Most certainly. Who was the question? Congressman? Who was yes. Wade? Yes. yes. Governor? Senator? Yes. A repeal? Mayor? It would be okay. Okay to repeal? It would be okay to repeal. It would be okay also if a strict instructionist judge viewed it as precedent, and I think a judge has to make that Would it be decision. okay if they didn't repeal it? I think that I think the court has to make that decision, and then the country can deal with it. We're we're a federalist system of government, and states could make their own decisions. Congressman, after 40 million dead because we have aborted them in this country, I say that that would be the greatest day in this country's history when that is in fact overturned. So, uh, Joel Mowbray, the greatest day in this country says we've had wars, we've had the Great Depression, we've had slavery, which we overcame, we had VE Day. And banning abortion would be the greatest day in this country's history. Does that reflect the state of the Republican Party soul today? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It reflects the, the, the state of the uh, 3 to 4 percent that Tom Tancredo hopes to get in the New Hampshire and Iowa primaries so that he can have his stamp on the election and have a name made for himself for speaking events later on in the future. I, I don't think it, it, it represents the, the broad mainstream view, which, by the way, the, the mainstream of the Republican Party is pro-life, not to knock that, but mm -hmm. to use the rhetoric that he did that's not where the mainstream of the GOP is. Joe well, there, were, there were the three guys who raised their hands and said they don't believe in evolution. We're going to get to that clip. We're going to get to that clip, so hold your fire neglected. on that one. Uh, d how do you think Rudy Giuliani did in that answer? 
I thought it was very feeble. And I think he has a big problem. And the problem is he's gone through different phases in his political development. You and I remember when he ran as the Liberal Party candidate. And one of the litmus tests for being the Liberal Party candidate was, would you support Medicaid funding of abortion in New York State? And he did. Okay, he, he got the Liberal Party candidates. Now he doesn't believe in that anymore. Back then, uh, there was a, uh, someone wrote this week, I think it was uh, Politico, uh, reported that he had made something like nine donations to uh, Planned, Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. Mm -hmm. That was back in the Donna Hanover phase of right. his life. Uh, so that was Liberal Rudy. Now, he's not Liberal Rudy anymore yeah. because he wants the Republican presidential nomination, but it's hard to erase all of that. But, Joel, does this issue matter at all in the general election, or is this just a Republican primary litmus test thing? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I think uh, I was listening to a guy who represents a, uh, an evangelical Christian organization uh, last night, and he said that in any other year, you would never have a Rudy Giuliani still uh, talked about as a formidable candidate, a frontrunner even, for the Republican Party nomination, given his social views. But it's because of the terrorism, it's because of, frankly, the <laughs> struggle we're in since 9-11, that Rudy has the, has the one guy who has the shine on him, and people will still stick with him, I think, at least until the end, as a possible a possibility. There's viewers, we have the phone number up on the screen. Anything you want to say about the Republican or Democratic presidential primary campaigns as of now, 212-251-0801, 212-251-0801, chime in. You know, Brian, I think there's a danger for the Republican Party in the Giuliani candidacy, and it's this. As the primary season goes on, more of his uh, liberal uh, views about uh, not just abortion but homosexuality and other issues are going to come out. And the danger is for the Republicans that if he is the nominee, there could be a, a Nader-type third-party candidacy on the right. On the right. Also on Rudy, though, and I'll get your response to that in a minute, but maybe in this context, two columns in the papers today, Joel, mm -hmm. Mike Lupica in the Daily News says abortion won't turn out to be Rudy's biggest Achilles heel, uh, Bernie Carrick will. And Wayne Barrett in the Village Voice says Giuliani took valuable World Series rings as gifts from the New York Yankees all four years that they won the World Series when he was mayor, gifts that the Voice says are worth $200,000, for which he only paid 16000 after he left office, and that he is vulnerable to prosecution for violating campaign finance laws. Want to comment on either of those? Uh, gee, uh, I think Rudy Giuliani, I, 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 frankly, I'm surprised that he's still viewed as a front runner. Uh, he's got so many skeletons in his closet, not even, the, not even the social issues stuff that everyone else talks about. This guy, you know, there are stories. You, you live in New York City long enough, you hear the buzz about the time, you know, before he was uh, mayor, the time during his mayorship, and since the mayorship. You hear a lot of things. Now, how much of it is actually true? I have no idea. Maybe none of it's true, right? But, you know, there's, you know, there's, you always want to believe, or you think there's maybe fire where there's smoke, and there's definitely smoke. I think more is going to come out on Rudy. I think he's going to get hit on something ethical between uh, now and uh, next January. The, Car the Carrick issue is a problem because it goes to the heart of his claim to be the great leader against terrorism, because he almost made Bernard Carrick the, the Secretary of Homeland Security. I mean, it was on the basis of Rudy's promotion of a guy who had actually been sort of his bodyguard and driver during a campaign, promoting him up to corrections commissioner and then police commissioner for which he was not qualified, and then was ready to put him in as Homeland Security Commissioner, uh, Secretary, just on the basis of his loyalty yeah. to Rudy. I'll just say one other thing about the rings issue, besides the fact that those are some expensive rings they make, if it's really four for $200,000, uh, who knows if that's going to break out as anything. But George Steinbrenner, we will remember, is already a convicted felon for illegal contributions to the Nixon campaign. So who knows if not, we're not going to be revisiting that. Well, the other bit. thing is that Giuliani prosecuted other public <laughs> officials for violating the same law that he may have violated in this case. And according to, to the voice, at least, no other mayor of a World Series winner has ever actually right. been included in in the ring that the players get. Let's flip to the Democrats. In their debate, the headline for some was how nice Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were to each other. For example. Well, I think that uh, what Barack said is right. I mean, part of our challenge is to put together the political support throughout the country, particularly within the Republican Party, to join with us to bring an end to this war. You know, it sounds simple to say it, but it is more difficult to achieve it. And the problem is that the president seems determined not to change course, despite the fact that we are not gaining ground. 
We are in the middle of a multi-sided sectarian civil war. And we are doing everything we can to begin to move us out, and we need Republican support to finish the job. Joe Connison, unpack that answer politically for us, can you? Well, I, first of all, I think she is working very hard not to let uh, Barack Obama or Edwards get to her left on the war, because that's a very difficult position for her to be in in this primary season. That's why she came out this week with that position that they should uh, vote to deauthorize right. the war? Now, she had taken a similar position to that a few years ago with a Byrd uh, amendment, but yes, that's she's working hard to um, expiate the sin of voting for the war uh, and, and not apologizing for that, as Edwards uh, has done. Um, the second thing is, I think it's very much in her interest to be nice to uh, Senator Obama and vice versa. Remember, they got into a fight over that sort of David uh, Geffen uh, comment, right. and, and uh, neither of them came out looking good after that. Who's an Obama supporter who said, who nobody been, lies like the Clintons right, and, and he stuff had been, like he that. He had been a friend of the Clintons before. Yeah. And in the aftermath of that, I think they both ended up looking bad. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think they both know yeah. it's not in their interest to, to have a fight right now. Joel, you know what was interesting to me here? She is, according to four polls in the last week, the front runner out of everybody in either party. She would beat any of the Democrats by double digits. She would beat any of the Republicans by a few points. Um, she made virtually no news in that debate. You agree? Yeah, well, look, why why are we so focused on these polls, both internally and, and looking at general election, uh, election matchups, head to head, unless something changes dramatically, What's newsworthy? Why are we talking about? It? I was having a, just a friendly chat with a with a good friend of mine over at CNN, um, a pretty high ranking guy there, and he was all excited about talking about this poll number and that poll number. And to me, it's such a snooze. Remember Howard Dean, right? This guy was surging into January of '04 and then just utterly mm -hmm. collapsed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, by the right. way, that this is going to be Obama. Uh, come, you know, maybe even a few months sooner than Howard Dean collapsed. There's just no there there with Obama. And that, by the way, is Democrats who've seen him close up, who've said that to me, that they just came away dreadfully unimpressed. Is At Obama on the way down from well, the no there right there now factor? He, right, right now, now. he is. He's falling, he's falling in polls now. Yeah. And I think the problem is, I don't know whether there's a there there. I, I, I actually have a lot of respect for his intellect. What, what I think worries people is he is not putting forth substance in the campaign. And, and until he starts to do that, I think Joel is right. There's a danger for him that he's going to just deflate. So let's go right and on to our next clip. And the guy is clip. smart, and he is smart, but there's just the substance. That's right. it. So let's go right on to our next clip, which is related. John Edwards continues to run a campaign based, at least partly, on how much more specific he's getting on some major issues than Clinton or Obama, especially on one major issue. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that I have a very specific universal health care plan, uh, which I think is different than some others on the stage who are running for president. And I think we have a responsibility, if you want to be president of the United States, to tell the American people what it is you want to do. The rhetoric's not enough. High pollutant language is not enough. And my plan would require employers to cover all their employees or pay into a fund, covers the cracks in the health care system, mental health parity, which others have spoken about, chronic care, preventative care, long-term care, subsidizes health care costs, gives people a choice, including a government choice, no pre-existing conditions, banned as a matter of law, and the law actually requires that every single American be covered. Joel, uh, his reference to highfalutin language there, that's a direct shot at Obama, I presume. I, I would presume as well. And well, maybe we have to pres if we have to presume, then it's an indirect shot. Yeah, you know, look, I, I guess I've never understood the appeal of a John Edwards. I've seen him uh, give his pep talks. I've seen him at rallies. I, I covered him back in New Hampshire in '04. The guy is just—he's a pretty boy. And, and, and I don't even mean this as a partisan thing. You know, he, he, he talks like a trial lawyer there. Obviously, he's a smart guy, et cetera, et cetera. But when he gets up there into politician mode, all I can keep thinking of is that YouTube clip that's become very popular of him brushing his hair for two minutes straight in yeah, front of the camera. Yeah, but he also connects with a lot of Democrats. I will a tell kind you. Of I too. Moral, I on a kind of yeah. moral right. level. I was going to say, if you want to know... know the reason that he appeals to people, it's because of substance. It's because he actually has walked the walk, literally, on a picket line. Um, uh, and his, I heard Elizabeth Edwards on your show today, on the radio show making on this WNRC very this point, morning, yes. yes, saying we're the ones who have a serious anti-poverty program. We're the ones who are out there uh, with, you know, the and kind of substance. And if she were running, I think 
she would win. Well, she's a huge she's, asset. Oh, to him. she There's is. No question Absolutely. about it. Depends on how much she's out in the but, campaign. But she's, she's tremendous. Yeah, but he's. You know, I mean, he's he's been knocked as the pretty boy a lot. But the the truth is, there is a lot of substance there, and he is trying to make the substance appeal. So let's explore at least a little bit of this substance. Let's linger for a minute on the Edwards health care plan. Joe, let me challenge you on this. He said that uh, in that clip, quote, my plan would require employers to cover all their employees or pay into a fund that right. covers the cracks in the health care system. Right. Now, wasn't exa that exactly the provision of the Clinton health care plan that drew so much opposition from business that it wound up killing it? Uh, well, I think at that time the business community was simply opposed to any kind of national health care plan. And I actually think that's beginning to change now. Uh, because, uh, for instance, in Detroit, they understand that, it, what, are, what is it, $1,100 in every car is uh, the cost of providing health care to both the workers and retirees. And there's starting to be some consciousness among uh, at least the manufacturing industries that in other countries, government is, is subsidizing their industries by creating national health insurance, whereas in this country, it's, it's on the employers. So I think the climate has changed quite a bit. And I think, uh, you know, Edwards has one way of doing it. It's not the only way. What's the problem I have with his plan is that you have to find ways to cut costs in health care at the same time if you're going to provide universal care, which I am completely in favor of and always have been. But you need to have some modernization of the system in order to be able to There's a that. lot else in there. There's a requirement on individuals to ho own health care plans if they're not covered by other means. But uh, is the country ready for pay or play? No, no. Bill Clinton did an incredible job back in, uh, in 1992 campaigning on health care reform. And it really connected with people. You know, you always had you know, the sick people. He trot out behind him and talk about the need for, for health care and how the system has <laughs> failed these people. And look at how a guy as talented as Bill Clinton, with Hillary Clinton, he's a sharp lady, understands power, understands how to use it. And they got just their heads kicked in. On, on this, and I, I don't think if the Clintons, with all the head of steam they had behind them, all the momentum they had going, but just as it's a it, different time. Well, they now. made some very, they made and some very serious wants, tactical mistakes right. in that as but well. But also, as no, for and, today, and, and the business you, wants this monkey off their backs. Yeah, I think some business does. Some big business does. But people with the, 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 the large, big three, for example, with a lot of retirees, the smaller the businesses, which, by the way, that's where the real juice is now politically. It's small business. It's, it's consultants. It's people who are just trying to get out with, with the small business and self-employed. Uh, that's the future of American business, by the way. And these people would be adamantly opposed Joel, because I they'd want you be to show me, the burden you show of me large one, corporations. Show me one poll that doesn't have a, above 60% of the American people wanting some kind of national health insurance universal coverage. Show me one, just name one. And not, not just one poll now, one the poll in the last better, 20 years. The polls were better for that back in, I, I worked on the health care issue. I worked on the health care issue during the Clinton care issue. They're pretty good now. Nine, 94, 95, 93, 94. You mean they were like 76% then and they're only 69% now? I mean, I tell me what you mean by better. You talk about intensity. Remember that intensity matters much more than actual numbers. As far as the vote, why do you think, for example, that the entire GOP and many Dems are pro-life and pro-gun, for that matter, on, this, on the same thing? Because even when the majority of the American people want gun control or want to, you know, want to be pro-choice and have very few restrictions on abortion, the people who vote on those issues I'll, I'll, are. I'll it's make the a intensity. prediction right now. If if the OED elections return a, a bigger majority in the Senate for the Democrats and they keep their majority in the House and there's a Democratic president, there will be. Uh, some kind of universal health care legislation. Let's see what some of our callers are thinking. Eleanor in Chelsea, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Um, I had a couple of comments about uh, Obama and about Clinton. Uh, I heard Obama making a speech a while back where he was referring to the Moses generation and the Joshua generation, which are code, code words that fundamentalists use about um, the Joshua generation, which is going to infiltrate and take over the government. I'm, I'm not making this up and turn this into a Christian nation. He wasn't talking about Robert Moses, I guess. Well, I don't know. Is there anything there in your opinion, Joe? Well, I think it's true that Obama is interested in, in using uh, Christian symbolic language to appeal to people, and I actually think that's smart. I mean, I don't believe he's interested in creating a theocratic government. If I did think so, I would oppose him. Uh, with all my strength, but I think he does try to use that kind of language. I'll take that snicker as agreement with Joe on this point. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth in Midtown, you're on the air. Hello, Kenneth. Well, hello there. Uh, it's a pleasure to be 
talking to you. I'm a college professor, retiree. I worked in the military base for 19 years, so I, I can relate to, to, to the spirit and the mind and the boldness and the bravery of these people. I have to be editing myself at this moment. Your congratulations in the name of all the people who love justice and democracy. Uh, my comment here is that the Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, of Iran, foreign, foreign, foreign Relations, has indirectly uh, given a blank check to Hillary because they want to play a kind of associate uh, role action practice with the United States so as to keep the new Iraq uh, on hold on their side and to be a leader. Why does that benefit Hillary? Uh, I, because Hillary, they can see, uh, as uh, Bill Clinton was a co-founder of the Palestinian uh, autonomous state, and, and he had a fat coming to Washington, and everybody was embracing, and Hillary was also celebrating the Ramadan in, in the White House. All right, I'm going to leave it there. We actually are going to come back later. I'm not sure I understood that, but we are going to come back later to uh, how the Democrats went around in their debate on the question of whether to hold off nuclear bombing of Iran as a potential option. Uh, but in the Republican debate, the media took note of how infrequently the candidates mentioned President Bush. One exception was this statement by Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Giuliani, I think we should remind ourselves, because I remember it every day, that on September 11, 2001, we thought we were going to be attacked many, many times between then and now. We haven't been. I believe we had a president who made the right decision at the right time on September 20th, 2001 to put us on offense against terrorists. I think history will remember him for that, and I think we as Republicans should remind people of that. Okay, Joel Mowbray, what's the role of President Bush in this campaign? Boy, 28% uh, is not a big part of the public. That's you want to rally approval, behind you. approval rating. Yeah. Uh, it's a curious move. It's also one where I think Rudy uh, believes, I think in his calculus, that he's got to get through the primary, that if he can just get through the primary, he's got enough appeal to the mainstream. Uh, and a lot of these yeah, Dems who, you know, th th they might be liberal, but they really want to be safe. And there's a, there's a big chunk, of, and certainly not the base, by the way, of the Democratic Party, but there are a lot of people who just would casually vote for Democrats who I think would pick up and vote for Giuliani to be comfortable with his social issues. They wouldn't be scared of him. And uh, I think Giuliani is hoping that he can just get through the, the primaries so he picks up people who are, you know, hawks, picks up people who are still the Bush supporters. 28% of the public is probably still 60% of the Republican uh, vote. What I think I saw in the debate last week and what I think I see in general from the Republican hopefuls Right. is that they won't express any public love for the president, but then they reflect his policy positions to the T, especially on arguably the two biggest ones, the war in Iraq and tax cuts. Well, I think if you're talking about the base, the biggest issue is uh, becoming immigration. That is becoming the biggest issue. Uh, I think we saw that, by the way, in this last election cycle, that those who didn't address that issue uh, really paid a price. But the two front runners on the Republican side have the wrong position on immigration for the base. Right? Well, right, no, I certainly both agree. I agree with Joe, but that's where Bush's position is as well. I mean, Bush wants to have guest worker. You could call it amnesty. There's a debate right. about whether or not to call right. it I that. But the only, only column I've written praising Bush was about but, immigration. But it even more makes which my probably point. probably well, gives it, Bush some heartburn. Didn't help him that much. It almost, yes. you know, it almost makes my point even more that if. If you accept them as the two front runners, I guess in addition to Romney, then they're together on tax cuts with the president, they're together on the war with the president, and together on immigration, and yet this president is reviled Here, on the left, here's, reviled, here's, here's reviled the increasingly on the right. The problem that they have is that they would, both McCain and Giuliani, or for that matter any Republican running for president, would be much better off if the war somehow concluded, or the U.S. involvement in the war concluded before the election. That is in direct contravention to what Bush is trying to do, which is to keep the war going until he leaves office uh, because he wants someone else to have the burden of ending it. I would actually disagree about the base hating Bush. I don't think they hate Bush. I think a lot of them still love Bush. In fact, the more hatred heaped upon him by the Democrats, the more some of the people in the base love Bush. But there's also just a fatigue factor. You know, you just kind of get sick and tired well, he's of all the stuff. I mean, he's well, made them look bad. The, there's, the, there's the competency issue. That, that's a big right. deal. You know, Gonzalez sticking by him. Why? Why in God's green earth would you stick by Gonzalez well, after all of this? He knows and the where private a lot of email accounts of the RNC, are there's a lot of stuff that just looks bad. And, you know, Bush could just get rid of it, fire people tomorrow. But, you know, and I, I admire his loyalty. As someone who lived inside the cesspool of Washington, I admire his loyalty. But it, you've got to have limits even on that. Sal and Bensonhurst, you're on the air. Hi, Sal. Yeah, how you doing, Brian? All right. I was wondering, uh, I think the biggest problem with this discussion is that 
Thor's talking about how it's Dirk's penis. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Dan in downtown, I'm sorry, it's, uh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll do our next clip next. Each debate had its so-called fringe candidates, the one given li little chance to win the nomination but who run out of principle to raise issues they feel are important. On the Republican side, one such candidate was Texas Congressman Ron Paul, who was actually very conservative in many ways, but is a staunch opponent of the Iraq War. Throughout the 20th century, the Republican Party benefited from a non-interventionist foreign policy. Think of how Eisenhower came in to stop the Korean War. Think of how Nixon was elected to stop the mess in Vietnam. How did we win the election in the year 2000? We talked about a humble foreign policy, no nation building, don't police the world. That is a conservative, it's a Republican, it's a pro-American, it follows the Founding Fathers, and besides, it follows the Constitution. I try very hard to solve this problem before we went to war by saying, declare war if you want to go to war, go to war, fight it, and win it. But don't get into it for political reasons or to enforce UN resolutions or pretend the Iraqis were a national threat to us. So, Joel Mowbray, Ron Paul, who is he? Why is he here? Uh, he is the guy who just wants to make a lot of noise, get a little claim to fame. It's not the first time he's run for president. First time he's run for president as a Republican. Really? Uh, yes, he uh, used to be a libertarian, still is a libertarian who belongs to the Republican Party. Uh, had a very hard-fought race at first, and now is actually popular in his district and just wins by comfortable margins. Uh, surprising enough, I'm sure the delay redistricting did not hurt that for him. And uh, he's uh, he's in Texas, and he's gosh, I think going on 14 years now. He's been there uh, been there a while. He, he might just die in office. I don't know. Uh, he's a principal guy. I used to work for Mark Sanford, uh, now governor of South Carolina. And sometimes they were the only two people to vote against uh, various federal spending things because they just vote out against all federal spending that's outside of that's uh, liberta necessary. That's libertarian government principle. Yeah. But it, it, is there perhaps a growing wing of the Republican Party that is, maybe not to that extent, but fiscally conservative, conservative on, on a lot of issues, libertarian in many ways, but also against the war? You know, sure, there are a lot of voters like that. How many of them are base voters, the people who turn out in Republican primaries? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, certainly have a lot of people who are frustrated with the war. There are a lot of people, look, who've had family members who have died, who know people who have family members who have died. And, you know, there are most, most of America is starting to get within a couple degrees of separation, at least, of someone who is died or certainly they're injured. They're not against the, the war. war in the same way that Ron Paul is against the war. Ron okay, Paul is enough. against the war because Ron Paul is a libertarian isolationist. Uh, most Americans are against this war now because they believe they were lied to by the Bush administration and they're appalled by the incompetence with which the war has been prosecuted. Uh, and so that's, that's different than a libertarian position mm -hmm. against the war. I think a lot of people, uh, if they didn't feel that they'd been lied to, if there had been WMDs there, or if they ended up believing that somehow Saddam Hussein <coughs> was involved with al-Qaeda, both of which turned out to be uh, canards, they would feel differently about the war, even though we have lost 3,000 uh, Americans there. I, I'm sorry. Uh, this idea that there is no connection between uh, I Iraqi intelligence under Saddam and al-Qaeda, that, well, that is a great urban legend. No, that's our the, government's position now. The guy that position, we yeah. just uh, announced the capture of about a week and a half ago, Mr. al-Iraqi, we captured him going from Iran trying to get back into Iraq. He is the mastermind of the July 7th bombings in London. He is, before he went to al-Qaeda, to mastermind al Al-Qaeda's second highest profile attack against the West, first, of course, being 9-11. He was a top uh, official in Saddam's military. He was a major working in Saddam's military. Haven't he went we from put there this to Al-Qaeda. Uh, haven't we put this question to rest? Hasn't the no, establishment, the Republican establishment, put yeah, this question to rest? Yeah, I was going to say, read the 9-11 report. The read the 9-11 commission report. Which talks about the three Iraq meetings study group between report. bin Laden yeah. personally and Iraqi intelligence officials. Yeah. As they late came as to nothing. They came to nothing. Yeah, as late as 1996. They couldn't find proof of operational. One at a time. Okay. But... That George Tenet book that just came out, I was a little surprised to see that while he was affirming this position that there was no operational relationship, he did reiterate that there was a history of safe haven. There was a history of Where was the safe haven, though? Where was the safe haven? I see. I, I'm not sure I trust well, I don't George, know, but George Tenet's George word Tenet about says. this. The safe haven was in northern Iraq. This is where uh, Zarqawi was believed to be. That's correct. He was in a camp up there. We could have blown him away at any given moment. And the reason he was not taken out was so that George Tenet and Condi Rice and Dick Cheney could say, hey, you know what, there's al-Qaeda in Iraq, because they let them stay there. 
This was uh, very dishonest on their part. All right. That's an awfully cynical view. Well, Joe. that's what they did. We're not going to settle this I'm one I'm sorry, tonight. what proof do you have of that? What, what, what proof? What proof do you have that Condi That's and Tennant knew how to find him, to kill him, and They knew exactly where they were. To. They knew exactly where they were because the Kurds, knew where, the Kurds knew exactly where they were. They knew where their camp was. They'd actually had uh, uh, military conflict with them in the north of Iraq. Saddam had nothing to do with them up there. Now, you know what? This would be an interesting debating point if the two of you were running for president. But I think whoever the Republican and Democratic nominees are are going to agree that for their purposes there was no operational relationship between Saddam and al-Qaeda and that's where it's going to stay on the campaign trail. So we saw a little bit of Ron Paul and talked about him. Now in the Democratic debate one of the big fringe surprises was the feisty performance by former Alaska Senator Mike Gravel who thinks the Democratic Congress is wimping out on the war. Now, with respect to what's going on in the Congress, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. So we passed, and the media is in a frenzy right today with what has been passed. What has been passed? George Bush communicated over a year ago that he would not get out of Iraq until he left office. Do we not believe him? We need to find another way. That's where I, I really would like to sit down with Pelosi and with Reid, and, and I would hope the other senators would focus on how do you get out? You pass a law, not a resolution, a law, making it a felony to stay there. And I'll give you the text of it. And if, you, if you're worried about filibuster, here's what you do tactically. They can pass it in the House. we got the votes there. In the Senate, let them filibuster it. And let Reed call up every, at 12 o'clock every day to have a cloture vote and let the American people see clearly who's keeping the war going and who's not. And that's just the beginning of the tactic if they're tough enough to do it. Ohio Congressman Dennis Kucinich also took the Democratic Congress to task in the first debate for passing the war funding bill, even with a timetable for withdrawal. I think it's inconsistent to tell the American people that you oppose the war, and yet you continue to vote to fund the war, because every time you vote to fund the war, you're reauthorizing the war all over again. As a matter of fact, my good friends here from the Senate just came back from Washington, D.C., where they voted to continue funding the war. The Democrats have the power to end the war right now, and that's what we should do. There were no obligation to give George Bush any money at all. The money's in the pipeline to bring the troops home. And that's exactly what ought to be done at this moment. And if you thought Gravel and Kucinich would respectively state their cases, then get out of the major candidate's way, you and the Democratic frontrunners had another thing coming. Check out, if you didn't watch the debate, how they went off on Barack Obama. I think it would be a profound mistake for us to initiate a war with Iran. But have no doubt, uh, Iran possessing nuclear weapons will be a major threat to us and to the region. I understand that, but they're in the process of developing it. And I don't think that's disputed by any expert. They are the largest state sponsor of terrorism. It is disputed uh, Hezbollah by, uh, and Hamas. It is and, disputed. And there is no contradiction, Dennis, it is between, uh, let, let me finish. There is no contradiction between us taking seriously the need, as you do, to want to strengthen our alliances around the world. But I think it is important for us to also recognize that uh, if we have nuclear proliferators around the world, uh, that potentially can place a nuclear weapon into the hands of terrorists. That is a profound security threat for America, way, one that we have to take seriously. Way over on time. Senator right. Gravel, uh, 30 seconds, please. No, with respect there, Ron, we, we've sanctioned them for 26 years. We scared the bejesus out of them when the president says they're, they're evil. Well, you know something? These things don't work. They don't work. We need to recognize them. And you know something? Who is the greatest violator of the non-proliferation treaty? The United States of America. We signed a pledge that we would begin to disarm, and we're not doing it. We're expanding our nukes. Who the hell are we going to nuke? Senator, Tell me, Barack, who, who, Barack who's, I'm not who are you to want to nuke? Any, I'm not planning to nuke anybody right now, Mike. I Good. promise you. Good. We're safe. Uh, now, Joe Connison, you're smiling. There may be a tendency to want to laugh off that exchange, but does that reflect a real divide in the Democratic Party between those in the foreign policy and U.S. as a, you know, as a world power establishment, including Obama, and some who think that the United States is just way too aggressive and an imperialist empire? Well, I, the, the latter are not necessarily in the Democratic Party. I, I think they may come around the Democratic Party from time to time. That The committed Democrats 
I think are in two camps right now in the war. There are people who are trying to find a way to, to push the president uh, and, and force the Republicans who are themselves endangered in the next election to begin to come over on this issue. And there are those who are very impatient with that strategy and want some kind of legislation right away that I don't think, frankly, can pass right now. I mean, the Democrats have one vote in the Senate, and that is the vote of a Senator, Joe Lieberman, who is in favor of the war. He's more in favor of the war than a lot of Republicans are. Right, but that's relatively, you know, small uh, details. I realize it's a huge no, thing that's right a big now, detail. the war funding bill, obviously. But on the larger question of America's place in the world, I mean, is an opposition to the war in America, including in the Democratic base, divided between those who just thought it didn't work out very well and it's strategically not good for America and the troops should come home and stop dying and those who thought from the start that the war was illegal and an act of U.S. aggression. Doesn't that represent a fair number of people in the Democratic base? I think there would be a number of people who would say that the war was being based on, on <clears throat> lies and misrepresentations uh, lacked legality because of the way they went about it in the United Nations. However, um, I would say there is a strong consensus in the Democratic Party that uh, the president made a mistake by not sticking to the task in Afghanistan and getting Osama bin Laden. I think that is the overwhelming majority and, and that people in the Democratic Party regarded the war in Afghanistan as a just war and regarded uh, military action against al-Qaeda as, as just military action. Joel Mubray, let me get a quick take from you on the positions of the presidential candidates versus the positions of the Democratic leaders in Congress. John Edwards is now pushing this idea of sending the president the same bill with the war funding but with a timetable for withdrawal over and over again and keep daring him to veto it. Hillary Clinton wants to deauthorize, rescind the authorization for the war that was passed in 2002. But apparently the Democratic leaders, at least so far, Reid and Pelosi, are having none of it. Well, in economics, we talk about game theory, where each individual has his own set of incentives. Uh, when you are a presidential candidate trying to stand out, trying to uh, play to the base, and you want to make your move, you want something gimmicky. You want something people can grab onto and explain very simply. And notice how quickly you're able to explain the Edwards position and the Clinton position and get it spot on. Well, if you're the Democrats running the Congress, and the House, and the Senate, and you want to stay in power, you have a lot of people who yeah. are representing Republican districts, Republican Republican states, they can't be gimmicky. They've got to look like they are serious about governing. So, 10 seconds, do you agree? I do agree. And I think the part of the game is to try to bring over Republicans who are in danger and who have many more seats at stake, for example, in the Senate next time, closer to the Democratic position. And I gather Obama is working state by state to try to do that, especially with some vulnerable uh, that, senators that is the game, from yeah. the Republican Party. Now, one of the main themes of the Republican candidates in their debate was faith and values. Here is a key exchange from the Republican debate between the moderator Chris Matthews and candidate Mitt Romney. He seems to me here, by the way, like a student from the Ronald Reagan School of Public Speaking. See if you agree. Governor Romney, what do you say to Roman Catholic bishops who would deny communion to elected officials who support abortion rights? I don't say anything to Roman Catholic bishops. They can do whatever the heck they want. Uh, <laughs> Roman Catholic bishops are in a private institution, a religion, and they can do whatever they want in a religion. Uh, America doesn't... Do you see that as interference in public life? Well, I, I can't imagine a, a, a government telling a church who can have communion in their church. I can't imagine... We have a separation of church and state. It served us well in this country. Okay. This is a nation, after all, that wants a leader that's a person of faith but we don't choose our leader based on which church they go to. This is a, this is a nation which also uh, comes together. We unite over faith and over the right of people to worship as they choose. The people we're fighting, they're the ones who divide over faith and decide matters of this nature right. in the public forum. This is a place where, where we celebrate different religions and different Thank faiths. Thank you, Governor. So what do you think there, Joel? I mean, he's, he talks faster than Reagan, but he's got this kind of Midwestern, gosh, gee, kind of... You know, folksy thing. You know, I've actually driven, I, I'm from Illinois, so I've driven by Dixon, Illinois, a number of times. Uh, Ronald Reagan's hometown. The, the, Ronald Reagan's hometown. And every time I see Mitt Romney, I don't necessarily get the twinge of Reagan, but I keep thinking, this guy's got to be able to win. Now, I know in my head, I, I, I think of the fact that he's a Mormon. It's got to be an issue in the South because the polling says it is. You talk to people down in the South, the Republican uh, strategists, and they say it is an issue. Why, why in the South? I mean, that means that the people who, who are ready to discriminate against him because he's a Mormon are 
Christian evangelicals it's not even who you would think are close to that. No, it's not even so much discrimination. And, like, and I understand the, the, the concern. It, it seems almost for, foreign to them, right? They just don't know many well, I'll Mormons. I'll tell you exactly why. I, I don't, I, look, I, I don't think it is discrimination. I, I, think, it's, I think it's unfortunate because, look, I've gotten to know a lot of Mormons. I went to law school with, with a bunch of Mormons. And uh, wonderful people. I mean, really. I mean, I, again, I don't really understand the religion, and I've, I've tried to look at it. It, it seems a little strange to me. Um, so you get, into a lot of, you get into a lot of Mormons? No. Well, I, I've, 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 re I've read up on the religion. Yes. I've talked to my friends. Um, but at the same time, you know, he cut such an imposing uh, figure. He's a dynamic speaker. He's great working in the crowd. If the, he wasn't a Mormon, if he didn't have some of the other baggage about 94 and the positions he took Flip against Kennedy and all that. Evolving. And yeah, he, he does have some answers where he's too cute by half, like you're saying he's a lifetime hunter and saying he voted for Paul Song, yes. a decent, honorable guy, because he was the weakest Democrat he wanted to have go up against Bush. In other words, if he, if he that's weren't Mitt Romney, Romney, that's just you that's know, why he registered as a Democrat. Yeah. If he weren't Mitt Romney, he'd be doing great. But uh, then he'd be a great Mitt Romney. The problem he has is that in evangelical Christianity, certainly on the religious right, they have been telling uh, their people for many years that Mormonism is a cult. Uh, if you go online... Oh, some have, some have, many not ha all. Many have, uh, many have, many have. So, for example, Jerry Falwell has, and, and Pat Robertson has. The biggest, a uh, lo lot of the biggest religious right constituencies have been told for many years that Mormonism is, a, is an evil cult. <clears throat> so that's one. It's hard to turn that around in the midst of a presidential campaign. The second thing I wanted to say about that is that Matthews asked that question of the wrong person. He needed to ask that question of Rudolph Giuliani. Do you expect, like John Kerry, that you are going to be told you shouldn't be able to receive communion because mm -hmm. you're a supporter mm -hmm. of abortion rights? And I would have been very interested to hear Rudy's well, answer to maybe that. Maybe he'll be asked that in the next debate, which I think is next Tuesday we'll, night we'll on see. Fox. Uh, but so Romney's positions evolve. And speaking of evolution, another memorable moment concerning religion in the Republican debate came in response to questioner Jim Vanderhei of Politico.com. Uh, Senator McCain, uh, this comes from a Politico.com reader and was among the top vote getters in our early rounds. They want a yes or no. Do you believe in evolution? Yes. Is, I'm curious, is there anybody on the stage that does not agree in, uh, believe in evolution? Yeah. May I, may I Look, just add to that? Sure. <laughs> I, I believe in evolution, but I also believe when I hike the Grand Canyon and see it at sunset that the hand of God is there to also. Now, uh, Joe Connison, um, I'm, I'm sure that we didn't have a good By the way, that was angle. an excellent answer that McCain gave, which is that you can believe in God and evolution, too. That's the traditional position of the Catholic Church, for instance. That's called um, evolutionary theism, but that's not that's a dodge right. in the political sector? I, I, I don't think so at all. I think that was a, a, probably what he really believes. Um, it was incredibly amusing to see the other guys raise their hands. So who, it wasn't really a great shot. Who were the three hands? I'm sure you were keeping score. I believe it was Brownback, Tancredo, and Huckabee. And what does that mean, Joel? Nobody followed up there and asked them, well, what do you mean you don't believe in evolution? Well, look, I, I believe in evolution as the best theory we have going most likely, but you know, is evolution, you ask any scientists, is evolution fact certain? No. But is it by far the best theory? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I believe in teaching evolution in the schools, et cetera, but uh, if you were to ask me, do I know if a fact certain to be true, I probably wouldn't raise my hand. Yeah. And no scientist but I don't claims think that's that what it's they meant. fact certain true. Scientists well, that, say it is the point. best right. theory, exactly yeah. what yeah. you said. Uh, but what it means is it's shorthand for saying, I am a true believing evangelical. Creationist. Yes. Yeah. Now, noticeably, uh, uh, Mitt Romney did not raise his hand. No, and, and I have to admit that my knowledge of Mormonism is deficient in, in, and maybe Joel knows the answer to this, in knowing whether, in fact, the Mormons uh, accept evolution or not. Every debate needs a little comic relief. The Democrats got theirs from candidate Joe Biden answering this not-so-simple question from Brian Williams. Senator Biden, words have in the past gotten you in trouble, words that were borrowed and words that some found hateful. An editorial in the Los Angeles Times said, in addition to his uncontrolled verbosity, Biden is a gaffe machine. Can you reassure your voters in this country that you would have the discipline you would need on the world stage, Senator? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Biden.
in the Republican debate, maybe the comic relief came afterwards. While they didn't want to mention President Bush very much, they were falling all over themselves to mention a Republican president from the past, as documented in this montage from Real Time with Bill Maher. And now, the Republican presidential debates. We're in the house of Ronald Reagan. You know, Ronald Reagan said Ronald Reagan was a president of strength. Ronald Reagan used to say those are the things that Ronald Reagan taught us. Big ideas like Ronald Reagan. The Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. President Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. President Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. President Bush. That montage, uh, pretty popular on YouTube, by the way. It's one of the few things that's up there because the networks have been, uh, or the particular network, NBC, has been clamping down on people using the material on YouTube from the debates. But we have a minute left. left. Last question. Fred Thompson, Newt Gingrich, Michael Bloomberg, Al Gore, Joe Connison? Well, you know, uh, there are a lot of Democrats who have been waiting, waiting for Gore, and uh, I think they're likely to be disappointed. Uh, it's getting to be very, very late in this process. And, and the process, at the same time that Gore is not coming in, the process is speeding up. Uh, waiting for Gordo. Gordo. What about waiting for Newt Doe? Uh, is he viable? He's not viable. He's not? No. And he's I like an intellectual him. conservative force. He he's is. a true conservative. He is. Sometimes he can even appeal to liberals because he's such an intellectual. Why and not, Newt? The baggage. The baggage. I, I don't see how someone with his past, his history, is going to be able to, to get elected. Look, he, he, What's he, the baggage? Oh, gosh. Stepping off of Air Force One and complaining about uh, being seated in the <laughs> back of the plane, uh, the, the, the Medicare uh, you know, withering on the All vine. Right. Take your pick. To be continued. Thank you both very much. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30, and you can sign up for our podcast at cuny.tv. And please tune in to my daily radio show, The Brian Lehrer Show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning, the light bulbs that help the environment, can you stand them in your home? That's at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning on 93.9 FM and AM 820 WNYC. Have a great night.